So we will start the meeting. Thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, in our academic uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Yael Toledano, and I am the Director of International Relations at Bar-Ilan University. I want to welcome you all to our event tonight. This Zoom meeting has two important purposes. The first is your voice matters and can make a difference. And that's, uh, mat that, uh, that's the aim of uh, this meeting. The second one is to give also a strategic purpose perspective on what is going on in the situation in Israel and to provide you practical tools in the fight of public opinion. This is our engagement, not only at bar -Ilan University, but this is a battle shared with the entire academic sphere, as well as humanity at large. Before introducing our speakers of the night, just few directives. Please put yourself on mute. If you have any questions, you are invited to ask them in the chat box, and we will answer them after each part. So I will uh, moderate them. Please put them on the chat box, and I will uh, ask uh, the speaker or, uh, after the part. Another thing, part of our reality, <laughs> but uh, there might be a siren, uh, an alarm. So in that case, you will stay and wait for a few minutes to us, and we will move to a safe room. We will continue once it, it is finished. So now I would like to introduce our first speaker uh, to make the introduction part. Professor Rivka Tuval Mashiach is the academic head of the International School at Barilan University. She is also a clinical psychologist and senior lecturer in the Department of Psychology at Barilan University as well. Professor Mashiach, Rivka Tuval Mashiach, please. Hi. Good evening to you all, and thank you for being with us today. It has been 10 weeks since the October 7th terrible events and the war on, that on Hamas uh, broke. When we think about societies under trauma, we tend to think about the impact of a single traumatic event that ended and that might have ripple effects on those directly exposed and their close circles. But our reality in Israel is very different today. And there are two main reasons for this. Yeah. One is that we experience several traumatic events that still continue and have not ended. We are in a war in which many young soldiers are fighting and some are killed every day. We are exposed to missiles that endanger our lives. We still have many hostages in Gaza. There are tens of thousands of people that have been evacuated from their homes and still live in temporary housing and without work. All of this produce a reality of multiple traumas, which are continuous rather than a single limited time event. The second reason that is so challenging is that Israel is a small country and a very family oriented society. That means that every one of us has acquaintances who were killed or injured in the events of October 7. Every citizen in Israel is either a parent of a soldier, a brother of a soldier, or as you will hear later tonight, was fighting himself. That means that we are all exposed, not only through the media, but also through our friendships and family relationships with many victims or bereaved families. This reality in which we were all not only witnesses to the events that happened on October 7th, but are constantly exposed to an ongoing traumas, which are so multi-layered, is a very challenging reality, both at the personal level of each one of us and the professional level and as, as, as an academic community, like the university level. Traumatic events have an impact that may be lasting, both of individuals and on society. Many of our students are reserve soldiers and are now, as we speak, serving in the army, in the, either in the north or 
in the Gaza border or within Gaza, men and women. There are many spouses who are taking care of children who were left alone on the home front. We in Barilan have students who were killed or families of, wor of workers who lost a home or a family member. We have international students who found themselves in a foreign country at war and needed her help to understand what was going on. And as a university community, we are in what we professionals call shared reality, where we are both parents. For example, my sons are both in the military now. Uh, one of them is in Gaza. He just uh, was now uh, able to, to come home for the first time in three months. And my other son was released yesterday to be um, available for the delivery of, of uh, for the birth of his first son. So you can imagine the 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 transitions that we have all to to pass between our lives as civilians and our lives as as families uh, fighting for for Israel's existence. As a society, we are not only negatively impacted by uh, war and trauma. We also know how to be resilient, which means that we know how to deal well with the challenges I just described. As a university, Barilan has prepared very seriously to respond to all the different needs that we identified, whether it's postponing the academic year to allow all students time to organize or preparing a study assistance program for all those who serve in the reserves or preparing a fundraising campaign for financial aid for the reservists, or send a truck full of toys to children who were evacuated from their homes, or establish a school for evacuated children, or a hotline in, in the psychology department for counseling and giving support for those in distress. At today's meeting, we invite you to get a glimpse into our world and to hear about some of our challenges and the way we face them and cope with them. I wish you all an interesting evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Katova Mashiach, for your time, and uh, we appreciate uh, for taking uh, part of this uh, event. Uh, so now uh, I would I would like to introduce our second presenter, uh, Professor Etan Shamir. He is a director of the Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies, BESA Center, and head of the MA program in Security and Strategy in the Political Studies Department at Bar Ilan University. His research and interest and publication focus on military strategy, comment, and innovation. He will speak tonight on the background and strategic implications of the current war. Thank you. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, can you hear me well, uh, Yael? Yes, yes. Okay, great. So it's 12 uh, minutes, you said, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm starting <laughs> my, uh, my watch. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna speak a little bit about the uh, the strategic level of the of the war, talking a little bit about the uh, the Israeli Israeli objective, American objective, some regional implications, and we'll try to touch uh, to touch uh, all these points in the very short time I have, and maybe we'll have a few seconds more for uh, a few minutes more for uh, questions. Um, these are very complicated issues, uh, so I'm going to really uh, briefly uh, go over it. Um, uh, I know that uh, some of you might have uh, different opinions, uh, and this is uh, uh, this 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 is of course uh, very much legitimate uh, that people different people have different views on this. Uh, what I can offer is our uh, uh, our perspective from the Begin Sadat Center, my perspective, and some of the other people. Who are working with me, uh, looking at this uh, at this crisis and at this uh, war. So, uh, starting with the, I'll start with the Israeli objective uh, because uh, what I what I sense is there is a lot of confusion. There's a lot of confusion around the world, and I talk a lot to international media. I can hear from the questions, and then again from what I read, um, what different uh, journalists are writing. 
and different commentators that uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding of what Israel is trying to achieve, why it is trying to achieve it. And then there is also a lot of misunderstanding about what America, uh, why does America support Israel? What is the American objective? And then, of course, there are other questions regarding the day, uh, uh, the day, uh, the day after Israel has ended the operation in Gaza. What will happen in Gaza? What are the plans for Gaza? So, so on and so forth. I, I don't have answers, and no one has uh, clear answers to everything. But I can, I can offer a few directions uh, uh, as they are currently, as, the, as we are currently observing them. So, uh, what are the, the Israeli objective in Gaza? The Israeli objective in Gaza are very, very clear. Uh, they are very clear, but they are uh, very hard to achieve and they're not simple at all. Uh, Israel's objective in Gaza is first and foremost is to end Hamas rule in Gaza. Hamas is ruling now uh, for more than uh, uh, almost 20 years since 2005 is ruling Gaza. Uh, it it uh, uh, used Gaza as a, uh, to build, is, used its rule of Gaza to build its military capacities and then to use Gaza to uh, consi consistently harassing Israeli uh, uh, villages and towns through its uh, rockets uh, barrage and uh, other attacks. And this all has cum culminated uh, in the uh, uh, horrible attack that we witnessed on the, on the 7th of October. Uh, so ending Hamas rule, uh, rule of Gaza, and this has to be achieved by destroying Hamas uh, capabilities in Gaza, military capabilities. Because what we witness, and I was also a bit more optimistic in terms of the timelines, but what we are witnessing is uh, beyond uh, be, beyond even what we uh, what we imagined or what we thought uh, Hamas has in Gaza. The incredible, this incredible uh, amounts of weapons cache, of uh, tunnels, of uh, number of uh, number of terrorists that it has been able to recruit and train. Uh, all of this uh, poses a really military uh, challenge, especially uh, the way Hamas uh, is fighting uh, underground and hiding behind, uh, of course, civilians, using civilians as uh, human shields, embed, embed himself in, in civilians. In the urban uh, setting, I think this is probably the most difficult challenge uh, for any, and I speak to many military experts around the world, this is the most difficult uh, military challenge for every, any military military around the world. Uh, so this is uh, uh, this is what the IDF is trying uh, to achieve. Now, many people are saying, hey, uh, you're not going to eradicate Hamas. You're not going to end terror. This is not going to solve the problem. Yes, we're not, Israel will not be able to eradicate Hamas. Yes, Israel will not be able to completely eradicate terror. All this is true. Hamas is going to keep on uh, it's a strongholds in, uh, and it's support because Hamas is, of course, is an idea and it's an ideology and you have to fight the ideology and you have to fight the ideas. And there will be Hamas uh, terrorists in different places, even in Gaza after Israel will finish, like there are in the West Bank. And Hamas is very popular in the West Bank and there are Hamas terrorists uh, and Hamas attacks coming from the West Bank despite Israel's uh, activity there and the Israeli security forces that are acting there for many years. However, the ability of Hamas to control a territory when the entire resources that this territory provides in terms of uh, taxing, in terms of customs, in terms of uh, deliveries of um, uh, uh, the goods and taking it all to itself in order to build a mighty military machine, this will no longer exist. So if there will be an attack like uh, like a terrorist attack for, uh, here and there, sporadic things like we like Israel has from the West Bank, this is something that Israel can tolerate. But Israel cannot tolerate what Hamas uh, created in Gaza Strip, a serious military threat on its uh, on on its uh, uh, both military and mainly on its civilian uh, civilian population. So th this 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 is the re in regarding to the uh, uh, to the first objective of Israel. The second objective of Israel, uh, which was actually uh, decided by the government a few days after after the military operation began, if you remember, was to uh, to release the um, to release the the kidnapped to release the, those who were abducted uh, by Hamas. Now this poses a serious problem, of course, because. Um, 
Although the military operation, uh, as we saw, put pressure on Hamas, and they, and therefore, once the, there is a serious military pressure on them, they are willing to go for some reasonable uh, 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 exchange. Uh, the military operation also put at risk, as also we witness, uh, the, the abducted. So uh, there is a conflicting. Uh, uh, there is a conflicting in the in the objective themselves. It's 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 a very complicated situation, and I don't think uh, there is a clear answer. Israel cannot stop the uh, uh, the um, Israel cannot stop its op military operation. It will not cease its military operation. And again, this the military operation itself. It's what's bring Hamas to uh, to talk about uh, an exchange in the first place. Uh, the, the first thing Hamas wants is a, is a pause in operation because it's uh, it understands that it's losing. Uh, so uh, on the other hand, as I said, this is the, the, the very difficult reality that the military operation put in danger the the the, abduct, the abductees themselves, uh, and and the, the, there's no there really there's no solution for this uh, for this uh, situation. The, what the Israeli government has decided is to pursue the uh, the military operation again because of the clear uh, priorities uh, that it has um, it, to remove uh, Hamas until until Hamas the Hamas threat is removed completely. Israel will not be able will not be able to bring back uh, the uh, uh, the people who lived uh, on the settlements and the kibbutzim and the and the towns that now are refugees in their own country, what we call evacuees, it's actually a, a nice word for refugees in their own country that are sitting in different places and cannot go back and rebuild their communities. This area is, is has become a military area. No, no civilians are there because of the security threat. So unless Israel is able to uh, eradicate the Hamas threat, uh, this area will not be restored, the Israeli area. Um, so where we are, where we are, uh, the phase one was, uh, after the seventh was uh, an Israel uh, aerial bombardment. Phase two was major operations. Uh, we, Israel started in the north, the north of Gaza, and the population of the Gaza Strip was asked to move to the, to the south of Gaza. Most of them has moved. Some of them will not be able to move because Hamas was preventing them to move in order to use them as, as human shields. Um, we saw these tactics of Hamas. Uh, what we what we found so far again was was incredible, including uh, weapons, uh, high uh, weapons that were uh, under uh, um, cribs of babies and other children in children uh, bedrooms and cl children classes. Rockets. It's it's really mind blowing. Later. Uh, uh, so the major operation now um, has moved uh, almost clearing, almost finishing in, this, in the north, and now the focus is in the south, mainly in uh, Khan Yunus. Uh, Hamas has a few brigades, is deployed in a, in a different, in a certain way, and the, and the IDF has destroyed most of them, but there's still a lot of work to do. Um, now the, the 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 third phase is uh, which we are very close to the first phase is uh, uh, what we call counterinsurgency or low intensity. So it's bringing out some of the uh, IDF military out of Gaza, leaving some inside, and mainly using them to clear clearing operation, continuing to find find the uh, the uh, uh, the rest of the tunnels. Uh, uh, making sure that uh, they find uh, other places where Hamas is hiding. Uh, so it's what the military co call calls clearing and mopping up. Uh, this will allow to focus more in this phase where most of the Hamas military will be broken. It will it will uh, enable to focus more on the humanitarian aspects and helping the uh, uh, the uh, the population, the, the Palestinian population, as the American uh, uh, requires. I, I will go now to the American because I think it's it's uh, uh, for many people it's not clear outside Israel. For, I think for people in Israel it comes almost as natural that the Americans are the American support uh, is so uh, resolute uh, from the beginning because from day but uh, but I think in people outside Israel it's not always so clear, especially when you have a democratic president. 
Uh, and many people are asking me whether, for example, if Barack Obama was the president, whether we would see the same uh, the same amount of uh, of support. And and it's 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 a good question. And I don't know because there are differences, and I will touch on this uh, in terms of personality between the two presidents. Uh, but also, it's a different world, um, so it's it's really hard to say. But uh, what we do know is that Biden, from day one, was very firm about um, uh, about uh, uh, standing with Israel, both in words and in actions. Uh, in words, he stated the same goal as Israel did. He said, that the, and and the Americans are consistent with this to this day. They continue to say it every time and every, and I looked at the uh, announcement that uh, the defense minister, the, the, the secretary of defense and the national security advisor and the uh, and, 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 and everyone else who came to Israel, uh, secretary of state, they say the same statements that the Hamas rule in Gaza uh, will end and the, uh, and the reality in Gaza will be a different reality after the 7th of October. We are not going to go to what was before, which means Hamas in Gaza. Uh, now the media, I have to say, they love focusing on what is, are the gaps between Israel and the US. And there are a few gaps, but I, 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 in my opinion, they are not as big as the media always portrays them. Uh, the, the gap number one is that the Americans were saying from the get-go, be a little bit more careful about collateral damage and the population. And also, we want to make sure that there is a humanitarian support. Uh, uh, Israel said, and this is um, uh, proven right, that whatever humanitarian support we get into Gaza, Hamas will take control over it. And this is actually uh, fueling the war machine of Hamas. And this is exactly what's happening. On the other hand, Israel cannot ignore First of all, the crisis of the population we cannot ignore the request of the U.S. Uh, so, and of, and of course, we understand why the Americans are asking it. They're asking it because this is a democratic president and he has a lot of pressure from the public opinion, international public opinion, domestic public opinion, etc. Um, so Israel has agreed and the, uh, most of what the Americans requested is getting in to Gaza. Uh, the... Uh, the other request was uh, in, ter in terms of collateral damage. The Americans were involved and and and, and they've been presented with the uh, uh, with the uh, the Israeli plans. Two minutes, yeah, okay, and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up. I see my time is over. Uh, they they were very much involved in the Israeli plans. Uh, Israel now is part of Semcom, which is Central Command. Israel is uh, uh, it's completely integrated into the American uh, American uh, uh, command structure. Uh, the Israeli commanders are talking constantly with the American generals, and they saw the plans and they agreed to the plans. And once they saw that the destruction is very hard, they said, "Americans are said, be careful more about the South. We want to see a little bit less damage in the South." But the Americans were, ne were never very vocal about it. Yes, there were some instances where Biden were pushed. He said, uh, "You know, there were indiscriminate killing and, and and such and such." But in the end, the Americans were not pressing very hard on this, and they agreed with the Israeli plans. Um, there is another issue, which is the day after, the day after in Gaza. Uh, again, there's a lot of agreement. Most of it, uh, what what happened? What will happen in the day after? Israel is saying one thing: we want to make sure that Gaza is not a security threat. That's it. What the Americans are saying uh, that we have to have a comprehensive plan. Okay, but most of the plan is uh, the players that are going to take uh, uh, part of this plan is is not is not necessarily Israel. So Israel cannot decide for Saudi Arabia. And for the Emiratis, if they are going to invest money in uh, Gaza or not, this is not about an Israeli decision. The only thing that is really, uh, and I think Israel would like to see too, they are all those all those uh, uh, countries and maybe organization like the UN and others, EU, coming together for the day after after Hamas is gone, is broken, to reconstruct Gaza. This is great. The, there is one question that is uh, between the US and Israel is the role of the Palestinian Authority. And this is also, there is more agreement than disagreement. The disagreement is specifically with Netanyahu that he doesn't like to see the Palestinian Authority taking part in Gaza. And in any case, he says, 
if it is a Palestinian authority, I don't want to see the, the corrupted Palestinian authority that we have now. It is a weak and fragile uh, uh, organization. Uh, it cannot control even the West Bank. Therefore, uh, it's, I, don't, I, I see a problem uh, uh, that the Palestinian authority will take uh, Gaza as well. Now, the Americans are saying the same thing. The Americans are saying, we will, uh, uh, we will have the Palestinian authority, but the Palestinian authority will have to go through some reform. So, for, so it will be a different Palestinian authority. What do they mean exactly? They don't know themselves. So there is a dialogue of, uh, I think it's clear to everyone, the Palestinian authority, because you don't have any other player, will be part of the solution. But also there is an agreement that the Palestinian authority will have to transform itself in a certain way. Uh, so that's it regarding to the Americans. Now, um, I'll just, I'll just uh, uh, I'll say I didn't touch, I didn't have uh, uh, the time to talk about Hezbollah. I didn't have the time to talk about the Houthis because they're all part of this crisis that may grow or, or may come under control. We don't know. Uh, I will say that uh, the... Um, that uh, a good scenario will be that we will uh, contain Hezbollah, uh, contain the Houthis without a regional uh, crisis, uh, a horrible regional crisis, a horrible regional war. And we can go back after destroying Hamas, we can go back to rebuild Gaza as Gaza being the vehicle through to go back to the normalization process that Biden started. Uh, part of the Biden support, I didn't go into it again, I, I didn't have time to go to, again, why the Americans are so firmly supporting Israel, but part of Biden's support was because the way he understood this attack, and he, he goes and he says, he, he's saying it again and again, and recently, just a day ago, he said it again. He, he believes that this attack was aimed at his own initiative, his personal initiative, his personal legacy, uh, to normalize relations between Israel and Saudi and to open the road from India all the way to Haifa port. So he said, this is a plot by Iran to undermine it uh, and to intercept it. And, but the, uh, the, to tell you the truth, there's no evidence. There's no evidence for this, but this is what he says from day one. So I think what he wants to do is to, to, to go back to this initiative because this is success for him, to go back to this initiative and to um, uh, and and uh, renew uh, what he what he already started uh, on the on the point where he stopped and make Gaza part of this process of uh, uh, rebuilding the the Middle East around uh, the moderate uh, the moderate Arab state. I will stop here, Yael. Um, and if there if we have a few minutes for questions, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shamir. Uh, I, I know that uh, your, uh, uh, your part will uh, cause a lot of interest, so we have two questions. Uh, one, uh, the first one uh, was, uh, um, what is the number of Israeli citizens who had to leave homes in the north due to Hezbollah aggressions, if you know that? I'm sorry again, can you say it again? What is the number of Israeli citizens who had to leave homes in the north due to Hezbollah ag aggressions? What are the number? Okay, this is a simple, straightforward answer. Uh, I don't know. I don't have the exact numbers, but I think at the peak from both the south and north, we had like three hundred thousand people who were evacuated. I think the number now uh, altogether is about one forty thousand, one thirty thousand. And probably from the north is about half of it are, are from the north. So half from the south, half from the north, roughly. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I don't remember the, the exact number, but roughly half and half. So 60, 70,000 were evacuated from the north. Okay. And the second question from the same participant, uh, why does Israel don't remind the world that the U.S. defeated Nazi German in Germany by bombing endlessly German cities and nobody protested worldwide against it? Uh, I, I think that is a wide question about why in yes. Israel there is something. Uh... Look, the, the 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 we we do say it. First of all, they uh, the the international media and the international public opinion in the West they don't like they don't like this comparison. Uh, the reason they don't like this comparison is that they they see the they see first of all the Palestinian as the underdog, the Palestinian as the 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 victims, and uh, and Hamas. 
the way they tell the story is that Hamas is a result of the Persian victimhood, and this is the expression of the Persian victimhood, uh, who are oppressed, who are occupied. So uh, they are focusing on the on the Palestinian uh, suffering, and they don't see this uh, uh, comparison that we see, that we are fighting in Gaza, actually a mini state uh, controlled by a regime, Hamas regime that has an ideology like the Nazis to, to uh, exterminate all Jews, uh, and to kill as many Jews as, as, as possible, and to make sure that the land of Israel is cl cleared out of, uh, out of Jews as part of the ideology, and also uh, proved it by this ho horrific, uh, horrific mass massacres that they did. Now, there, there are um, uh, a few commentators who, who speak about it. I heard at least uh, one was British, not Israeli, was British, and he was here, and he was talking in, in various British media, and he said that the, the, actually, the Hamas is worse than some of the Nazis because the uh, the Eisen's group, the, 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 before the Nazis started the gas chambers, they were sending this this uh, units that used to just shoot Jews in masses uh, in East Europe. And and he said these these people at least they didn't uh, cheered up after killing the Jews. They 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 felt this is a, like a, a, a necessary uh, uh, duty. But you see the Hamas, they were cheering up. They were, they were really uh, uh, glorifying it. They were celebrating it. Uh, you remember the Hamas who called his mother and father and, and, and spoke highly about his achievement of killing uh, uh, so many Jews. So he said they are even worse than the Nazis. Uh, but, but again, uh, uh, it's very hard to convince. I'm, I'm, sometimes I'm using this comparison, but very, very um, uh, carefully. I, I, I have to be honest, the West, uh, forgot what does it mean to fight a war and what does it mean to fight a war of existence and what does it mean to fight uh, such uh, such horrible organizations such as Hamas. Uh, uh, they are uh, uh, they are speaking about it in, in sometimes in unreasonable uh, ways. Uh, you you are they say Israel is allowed to defend itself, but when you ask so what does it mean we are allowed to defend ourselves? We don't know, but you cannot do what you are doing. So what do you want us to do? How can we get up, go after Hamas without, uh, you know, without uh, doing what we are doing? And they don't have an answer. But they say what you're doing is not acceptable. This this is the position of many uh, many people I, I speak to in academia and other. By the way, uh, I'm I, again the military experts. Most of the military experts and for uh, coming from the military academias or, or military institutions in the in the West, they understand what we are doing. They, they they understand and they are uh, more supportive. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Shamir. Thank you for your time. And uh, uh, we hope in better circumstances, but thank you very much. And uh, now we will uh, move to our uh, uh, second speaker, uh, uh, third speaker, sorry. Uh, so now we'll move to uh, Professor Eitan Okun. Uh, Professor Elkhorn is an eminent researcher in the Gonda Brain Research Center in the, in, at bar -Ilan University uh, in the field of Alzheimer, and he is part of the Faculty of Life Sciences. But tonight he won't share with us his research. It will uh, be for another Zoom. Uh, but he will tell the story of uh, the 7th of October, uh, the story of his kibbutz, Alumim, and uh, his family survival. Professor Elkhorn, please. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Yael. Um, good evening, uh, everybody. Um, let me introduce myself. First of all, Yael, I, what is uh, the time frame? So that uh, I know. 15 minutes. 30 minutes, okay. No, 15, sorry. 15? <laughs> yes. <Okay. laughs> but all right. time. It's going to be challenging. Yes, um, I know. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Eitan Okun. I'm a professor at uh, the Life Sciences Faculty at Bar Ilan University. Um, normally, I'm doing Alzheimer's related research. Um, however, on the and I live with my family, wife Sarit, and our five uh, children, aged uh, nine to seventeen. Um, we live in uh, a kibbutz uh, called Alumim in the area that is adjacent to the Gaza Strip. I will show you in a, in a minute uh, a map of the area. And on the 7th um, of October, we were at home. 
uh, sleeping. 6.20 uh, a.m. we uh, started to hear uh, missiles being fired. Um, this is nothing new for us. It's been uh, like that for uh, over a decade. Uh, we're well versed with that. Um, we took all the all our kids to the sheltered room, uh, as we usually do. Um, but something was evidently different this time. It was the, the volume of fire of missiles, uh, of the number of missiles. I mean, uh, was uh, significantly um, larger. And after several minutes, I went out of the sheltered room and I started to hear uh, uh, rifles sound, the, the sound of rifles uh, and shots. And I immediately told uh, my wife that uh, something really different uh, is going on and that uh, there are uh, terrorists in our kibbutz. Um, just to give you a, an idea, the kibbutz is, uh, is home to uh, roughly 110 families. It's a small, uh, you can call it a village, I guess. Um, and so I told her that there are uh, terrorists in the in the kibbutz, and that um, I will get ready to uh, go to the armory, and that she should uh, lock uh, herself and everyone in the in the sheltered room, and not uh, let anyone uh, go uh, come into the house, not even if uh, knocks are being uh, knocked on the door or window or something. Uh, our, my friends from the defense squad, we were 12 people in the kibbutz at that, on that day. Uh, also, we wrote in our uh, WhatsApp group uh, that uh, they hear fires shot and that uh, the armory should be opened. Uh, at 7.15 a.m., um, we received message that the armory is opened and we should uh, uh, come over and take our rifles. So I got ready to leave the house. Uh, my children you know, told me not to leave the house because they were afraid, but uh, I told my wife to lock the door after me. I took my uh, vest, uh, you know, with the bullets from the from my shed in the yard and then uh, had to go to the armory without knowing where, whether there are terrorists around me. So we, we all met, several minutes it took, but uh, we all met in the in the armory, took uh, rifles, whatever we, we saw we took, and then uh, we started to um, to go uh, to the periphery of the kibbutz um, to find out where the terrorists are. Um, to make a long story short, there were uh, 35 terrorists uh, in the kibbutz. Um, I will share my screen now to show you some um, some maps and whatever happened. Okay, so um, this is our kibbutz. I imagine you can see the screen now. Um, it's it's really an agricultural uh, village. Uh, we mostly deal with agriculture uh, in the kibbutz. Um, this is a map of the area. What you see here in white, it's not the sea, it's, it's, the, it's Gaza. Um, so this is the border. This is partly agricultural area, partly um, uh, just uh, uh, land without uh, fields on it. This is our uh, kibbutz, it's called Alumim. Um, this is another kibbutz called Be'eri. Um, this is another one called Rim, Nachal Oz. You may have heard these uh, names. Um, this is the road that connects between all these uh, uh, all, all these kibbutzim. And the distance to the Gaza Strip is three kilometers from our kibbutz. So the terrorists came uh, within several few minutes through these uh, roads to the kibbutz. So I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom into the into the map of the kibbutz. You can see it's it's a very small place. These these are the this is the residential area. This is the area that we call. It's like it has a dairy farm. It has a chicken um, uh, sheds. 
It has uh, uh, places in which we sort out agricultural uh, uh, produce. So it's really divided into a residential area and um, a more uh, industrial area. Not industry, but agriculture. So what you see here in the yellow um, line and the yellow arrows is where they came from. They came from what, what's here is the back gate to the kibbutz. They came on this road. On the way, they found uh, foreign workers, mainly from Thailand and Nepal, um, working in the dairy farm. They killed some of them, uh, wounded the others. And then, they, then they continued to the main gate of the kibbutz, uh, where they immediately started to shoot at everyone who you know, drove on the main road. So this, this is the road. I drew it and colored it in red because it was filled with dozens of cars that were burned and, and exploded. And um, there were actually even uh, many people that ran away from a party that uh, happened uh, not far from here. They shot uh, everyone who was here. Um, and what you see here, these are arrows that indicate areas from which the terrorists also came into the kibbutz. So the one um, effort that they had came from here, but these are two additional efforts. So what happened um, as of uh, 7.15 that uh, we uh, went to the armory, get our weapons, we started to spread in this perimeter of the kibbutz uh, that we felt that we can defend. Um, I reminded, remind you, we were 12 versus uh, over 35 uh, terrorists here. And um, we had several uh, locations in which we had battles. This is one, the main gate. Several members of our defense squad were here engaging with some soldiers that came to the, uh, that were outside of the kibbutz. Um, I should emphasize that at the time we had no idea what's going on in the area. We had no idea that there is a, a combined uh, a strike throughout the area around Gaza. We had no idea how many terrorists are in our uh, kibbutz. Um, we only started to receive news um, towards the afternoon. So this was one area. Um, this is another area of clashes. And here, one of the kibbutz members um, uh, reported that he saw through uh, the fence here that there are 10 terrorists uh, that are penetrating the kibbutz from here. And he uh, called us, the defense squad. Uh, when we came to this uh, point, we saw one member of our defense squad wounded and we returned fire. And... Um, Actually, I wanna I wanna emphasize this here. So this is a close-up uh, picture of this area, okay, where the terrorists uh, came from. So again, they came from here. This is the 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 fence. This is the Chochova plantation. I can actually show you my house. This is my house. Uh, this is my wife's parents' house, and um. This is the house uh, of two guys of the defense squad that uh, were later wounded. So one guy was wounded here. We fought with them, and therefore the terrorists made the detour coming from here. Here they met uh, two, ad two additional members of our defense squad. Uh, they wounded them, but they also our uh, members were able to kill their uh, 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 the, the commander of this uh, a squad of terrorists. So they were blocked here and therefore they tried to do another detour and, and here they were also tackled by uh, two additional members of our uh, defense squad. So all in all, we were able to block their advance here uh, by, uh, the, by the defense squad. From here, the terrorists went, went back to the dairy farm where they killed uh, most of the other remaining uh, foreign workers that were there. Um, sadly, we, we couldn't really defend from this area where we were deployed. We couldn't really defend this area 
because of some tactical reasons, the, the, we, we just couldn't get there without being shot. Uh, so we had to maintain uh, uh, our line of defense here in this uh, area. Um, I want to give you some uh, some of the timeline. We actually began the fight at uh, 7.15 a.m. At 11.30, uh, we saw the first army unit that came to the kibbutz. So, so until that time, we, we were actually amazed that, that we got no help uh, all the way to, the, to, to 11.30. Um, we had no idea what's going on outside of the kibbutz. Um, and, and we had no idea what's going to happen. So we at 11.30, we established this defensive uh, line. You know, it's a line. We, we were uh, 12 people minus uh, three uh, members of the defense squad that were wounded at this point. Um, and we knew that the terrorists um, were located in these areas, both because we didn't allow them to penetrate more from here, and also because they were, um, I think their primary mission was to block the road to prevent reinforcements to the south. Um, so at 11.30, the first army unit arrived. It, it was actually a, a unit of the prison system. It's called Metzada. Eight guys that came um, and helped us. Um, at three uh, in the afternoon, the paratroopers, um, came into the kibbutz. So later on, we we learned that they were engaged in combats with the terrorists from the outside. And at three, they came inside, and we started to do. Um, a, we started to look at uh, all the houses to see whether uh, terrorists are hiding there, because the conf confusion was so um, uh, significant and. We, we had no idea whether there are more terrorists beyond those that we killed. Uh, indeed, in later days during the week, we uh, found uh, three more uh, terrorists that uh, were uh, that uh, surrendered and were taken for investigation. Um, on Sunday at 8.30, uh, the first convoy of uh, people that were during the weekend in Alumim and caught in, into this combat uh, was allowed to leave. Uh, the place, and at three thirty on Sunday afternoon, we the entire kibbutz was evacuated. So all uh, four hundred and some uh, people, um, with the exception of uh, of the defense squad. I think that's it for for my presentation. So I can stop sharing my screen. Um, so. When, when the entire kibbutz was evacuated, this is when the, our task of the defense squad uh, was finished. I mean, we, we did uh, what we had to do. And uh, during, the, during the week, until the weekend, we uh, participated in uh, things from finding out uh, all the weapons that the terrorists left, uh, find, uh, finding bodies, um, things like that. Um, all in all, as I told you, there were some 35 terrorists. They had grenade launchers and grenades, of course. They had machine guns, whereas we only had um, 12 rifles uh, and, and it dwindled uh, later on with our wounded. Uh, during the combat day, we, we had to evacuate under fire uh, our uh, members that were wounded, uh, as well as kibbutz members that were wounded. Um, there was another uh, another combat that I haven't mentioned in which a kibbutz member was uh, shot. Um, that was at the time when the army uh, uh, already came to the kibbutz and, and one of the soldiers were, were, was killed. Um, since then, so uh, all the families were evacuated to, to the center of Israel, uh, where we reside in a, in, in a hotel um, for over two months now. Um, there are difficulties um, for the families to be away from home, uh, really refugees. Um, 
people to to some extent try to make some uh, um, to, to get back to work etc but uh, most find it very very difficult to do so and I think that perhaps the most difficult thing is that we have no uh, um, certainty about what will happen when it will happen um, at this point we're not sure whether we can get back to our homes or whether we want to get, get back to our homes uh, complicated situation. Um, all in all, uh, just to summarize, I don't know how I am with the time. I, I believe it's close to 15 minutes. Um, all in all, 22 foreign workers were um, killed by the terrorists. Uh, two of them were kidnapped. Uh, one of the ki those that were kidnapped was returned in, in one of the uh, deals later on to exchange uh, hostages. Um, two soldiers were died during defense of the kibbutz. Uh, three of our, uh, actually four. Uh, one was wounded uh, during evacuation of, uh, of the other wounded guys. So four of them, uh, four of our defense squad were wounded. Um, yeah. Uh, I think that's it. That's really, I, I hope things were clear to you all. Uh, perhaps the maps helped it uh, get clearer. Uh, the aim of the of the terrorists was uh, really to kill innocent people, unarmed people. Um, and then... Um, I'm I'm really glad that at least in our case we were able to prevent the uh, massacre of uh, children, uh, women, men, elders, elderly individuals. That's it. If you have uh, if you have questions, happy to answer. Thank you very much, Professor Kuhn. Uh, I think that I don't see any question, but I think that uh, all the greetings that we saw before are directed. Uh, straight to you and to your family. We it's uh, very not easy. It's very not easy to to stand here two months after and uh, to tell your story. And uh, we thank you a lot for that. And uh, thank you for the seven of October and thank you for today for uh, telling that in front of our audience. Yeah. So any questions? Uh, it's now or never. <laughs> Can ask by uh, also by uh, um, mm. you know, using the the microphone, not necessarily the the chat system. Yes, I, I see one question. Well, I, I think there will all like to thank you for your very movie presentation and such bravery of your entire group. And we hope that the elimination of Hamas will be successful and that you'll all be able to go back home. And may you all have the strength to get through this. Thank you. I appreciate this. Um, I, yeah, I didn't really have a lot of choice, but uh, I, I have to tell you, I... I uh, I saw real bravery in, in the actions of, of the defense squad. Not only the defense squad, also the, I didn't mention it, but the, the wounded were taken to the, to a nurse, uh, to the, to the kibbutz nurse. Um, she's actually a midwife, but she had to, uh, she had to act, uh, uh, you know, under these circumstances as well. She did amazing. Her husband helped, um, um, um rescue uh, the wounded uh, with his car to the to the hospital under fire really commendable and, and also I have to mention the our, our wives uh who stayed at home with the kids uh while they didn't know what's gonna happen what's going on with us um so real bravery on their part um you know, pacifying the children during this difficult. Uh, I see some questions. Um, how am I coping with work and research? 
Uh, first of all, I have to tell you that my my students uh, were amazing. They they came to the lab uh, even during the first week after the after the attack, and in the coming weeks they also came and sent me images of them in the lab. It really gave me uh, a lot of strength, a lot of confidence. Uh, it was very touching. Um, gradually, I also came to the lab um, uh, to support them and, and try to do some research, some administrative work that I have to do in the faculty. And, and with time, I'm, I'm getting better and, and at that and, and being able to focus more and more. Um, but but it's it's undoubtedly it's not uh, it's not the same you know research requires a lot of focus and and um, modern research requires a lot of par doing a lot of things in parallel you know managing a, a, a research group it's not easy but doing the the best I can um, uh, did the there's a question did the terrorists take hostages from your kibbutz yeah. And uh, where you guys are able were able to fight them off. So, as I mentioned, sadly, um, to, to the best of my knowledge, they two uh, two hostages were taken from the foreign workers. The thing is that um, I think that their strategy was to steal cars from the places that they invaded and use the cars to take uh, people back uh, to Gaza. Um, they had the difficulty to do it in the kibbutz, um, in our kibbutz, and uh, many cars that they tried to take were uh, sort of abandoned. Uh, uh, of course, they ruined them and abandoned them. I haven't mentioned the damage that they done. I, I didn't put pictures of that, but really the entire area of the all things in the industry in the kibbutz was ruined. The dairy farm was ruined. Um, everything there is uh, damaged. Um, let's see. Um, How are your children? Uh, there is an, one last okay. question. How are your children processing this? Well, first of all, they're, he they're really heroes. Um, imagine, you know, they're young, they're 9 to 17, and they were um, in, a, in a sheltered room for, for a day and a half, uh, hearing, you know, shots, explosions, um, not being with me, or oh, I wasn't with them. Um, they really act maturely. They, I think they cope with it very well. They know the, the 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 gravity of the situation and nevertheless we try to help them um we we try so we we were moved into or evacuated to a city called Netanya in Israel and really after two weeks I I I started to look for a high school that will be able to take them such that their uh, routine will be kept so there was an, uh, an excellent uh, high school in, uh, in a town called Michmoret that uh, took them uh, to the school and also they were a part of a swimming team in the south where we live and, and a different uh, team took them, uh, over, took them over to them in Netanya so we try to keep their routine and, and now we start to um, uh, you know put them with a psychologist to, to speak with them, to, to share stuff. Uh, because I see, I see on them that um, it, it takes a toll and they need to talk about it um, with professionals and, and we start to do it. I do it as well with myself. Thank you very much. I would like to just say something. Can you hear me? Yes, yes if you if you just can uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm that's your name, please. My name is Farla, and um, I'm I'm speaking from Montreal, Quebec, and I just want you to know that um, so many of us are following you, supporting you, and and just thinking of you as just heroes and warriors, 
beyond. It's just beyond. And we, we just support you in every way. We're not doing the fighting. You're out there. I have a grandson who's in Gaza and think about him every day and just cannot believe your strength and hopefully your resilience. And just to know that the Jews are just there strong behind you. Thank you for, for your support. Um, we, we feel this support. Um, it's, it's difficult to, to, to share uh, the feelings we had um, in, in, in light of, of, the, of the immediate support and recruitment of people from abroad and from Israel uh, to help us. Um, uh, people really helped with donations and, and, and support, as I mentioned, to the children. This, is a, this doesn't go unnoticed. Uh, we truly appreciate it. This this is very important for us, um, and I think it's part of the you know our vuta that did the however it's been translated to English um, um, solidarity solidarity yeah, of of yes. uh, of uh, uh, Jews all over the world and and basically everyone who calls themselves uh, humans uh, that really care for other people that uh, are under such uh, circumstances. So thank you so much for, for all this support. Thank you. Thank you. And now I would uh, like uh, to move to another part. Um, I would like to share with you something. A picture, a voice, but uh, it, it, the voice is off, but we have his picture. So one moment. So this is uh, Elia. Uh, this is Elia and uh, Elia uh, Toledano. Is he was uh, one of uh, the hundreds of civilians who were taken hostages by the terrorists. No, 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 no. Ah, sorry. One moment. One moment. Sorry. Okay, can you see now? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so this is Elia, Elia Toledano. He, he was uh, one of the civilians who were taken as stages by the terrorist organization Hamas. Elia was taken in the music festival, from the music festival Nova, and his family was fighting nights and days to have him back. We had the sadness to be informed on the last Friday that Elia was found murdered by the Hamas, uh, and it was Friday. He was uh, he was brought to Israel uh, by our army by uh, the IDF. Uh, tonight we have the privilege to have with us uh, Paz Margalit. She is a cousin of Elia and also a student in chemistry at Bar Ilan University. Paz, please. So hello everyone. Like uh, Yael said, my name is Pastor Lodano. I'm a chemistry student at Barilan. Unfortunately, I'm not here today for being an amazing student and not even for promoting the Barilan uh, Debates Club, but because my cousin was taken hostage by Hamas. So I've been asked uh, to tell you a bit about uh, Elia. So here's uh, Elia's story. Elia is a kind-hearted person. Um, who really loves celebrating life. And on October 6, he went with his good friend Mia Sham to the Nova Festival, music festival in Reim. Um, I imagine you're all familiar with, uh, with the nature festival scenes. It's, it's like uh, Woodstock, but for techno music. 
Um, at half past six a.m., they can hear the alarms. Rockets have, are being fired from um, from Gaza. Unfortunately, as Israelis, uh, we are all familiar with the idea of rockets uh, in the south. So some of the people at the party decided to stay and keep celebrating, and um, others did not. Elia is a very smart kid, and he understands that uh, this is no ordinary situation. So he picks himself up and starts um, and start driving away. As they are driving, he and Mia, um, they are being shot, shot at by uh, uh, terrorists from Gaza that ran away to Israel. So um, then they leave the car and keep trying to get away by foot for about 30 minutes. Their last location that we get from them is near uh, Kibbutz uh, Miflasim. As they are walking, they are making calls to Magen David Dom, which is like 911. Uh, um, and they call their friends to come rescue them, but unfortunately, it was no success. The terrorists took them away. On October 18, like, we received the message um, that Eliyahu has been taken hostage. Until then, we had no idea what actually happened to him. For 68 days, we were worried sick, and ever since getting the message that he has been kidnapped, we have been doing anything we could, anything we could think of, really. We got him French citizenship. We held events to increase awareness of his situation with the biggest artists in Israel. If you know, Ravid Plotnik, Noga Ayres, and a lot of others. Just for scales, that's like getting Eminem and Billie Eilish to come to your hometown. We did all this just to get him back alive. For 68 days, 68 days, we were worrying, worried, crying, not sleeping. We were hoping and praying and truly believing that he would come back safe and sound and that we would someday laugh about this story because this is what Ilya would do. This is what Ilya would do. He, he would sit down and, and laugh about it and say it was an experience and and we got this as Jews, we got this. But unfortunately, last Thursday, last Thursday night, we received the message that his body has been rescued from the tunnels in Gaza. On Friday, we buried him. The light of our lives was always happy he truly was the happiest guy i knew and he was always the first to help everyone in it i'm sorry i'm a bit emotional <laughs> during the entire week where the close family was mourning in the shiva we heard countless stories uh from friends of elia on all the good he brought to the world one story about elia that really catch my eye my year he was in the business Ilya was in the business of producing uh events producing events which is uh, a job where the whole essence of it is to make people happy and overall to do good at one of the weddings he produced uh there was very loud fight between the two families um you know wedding day is always very um uh, there is a tension between the families and this time um the groom the groom went away uh he left the venue and what elia did is that he went he went to the groom he talked to him and calmed him down and convinced him to go back inside and go through with with a with the wedding just as planned today the groom is happily married with two children, and he came to tell us this during the shiva. One more thing to say is that in the end, we had a body to bury, which is relatively intact. This tells us that he he was killed recently. He could he could have been found alive if we were came sooner. Elias' story shows how important it is to just. Um, that the hostages remain, remain everyone's first priority. Each day that goes by could have the hostages that are currently in Gaza facing terrible fate. And we need to try our hardest to avoid 
the death of any more of our people and bring them home now. So thank you for uh, coming coming to here. Thank you very much, Baz. I, I yeah, wish that I could have, send a... Yeah, sorry? Do you have the video I send you? Uh, yes, I think that I have. It? One moment. I will try to share to you, but I want uh, just to say to you uh, at the meantime okay. that I wish that uh, we could send you a, a real hug, but it will be a virtual hug. And thank you very much for uh, sharing with us your memories about Elia. And I, I, uh, I can't, I, I, I can't say that uh, I heard you at the beginning, but you are still use uh, the present time when you are uh, telling about uh, Elia. And it's difficult. Uh, we are seven days exactly. Yes. Uh, it uh, yes. Just today you. was ending the shiva. The shiva is uh, the seven days of uh, mourning in the Jewish tradition. Uh, yes, so I have it. One moment. No, 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 it's not that. No, I can't have, I, I can't download it. I'm sorry. Uh, but maybe I will uh, try to send a part of it in, uh, we will send a, um, a registering of um, a, of uh, the event. I will send that to all participants and maybe with a part of uh, the clip video of Elia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe a person want to share something, a thought, or to ask something? Well, I just want to thank you for such a beautiful, a beautiful speech about your cousin. You did it just magnificently. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paz. And uh, now uh, I would like to move to our last speaker for tonight. Um, so, uh, Dr. Barak Books, he's a lecturer in the Department of Political Studies and in the School of Communication. He will speak tonight on the Arabic media and times of war, its role and its influence. Dr. Books, please. Thank you so much. First of all, can everybody hear me well? Yes. I need to share a screen. Um, can everybody see the PPT presentation? Yes. No, yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, due to the time limit, first of all, it's very hard, you know, to linger and continue uh, following this very uh, emotional and personal uh, evidence. Um, and I want to share a personal thought. I'm a faculty at the International School, and we're uh, returning to teach in a week. And it's very challenging to continue, you know, uh, with the regular life following all of that. And uh, wow. Uh, let me move to the Arab media. I will try also to relay a message. Uh, due to the limited time span, I'm going to talk about specifically the Lebanese media and how the Israeli media is reflected in the Lebanese media, and maybe to uh, relay a message also. So um, this is a lot of text, but I'm going to run uh, quickly over that. Uh, I had a slide that uh, depicted the uh, first day uh, of the events on October 7th, on which uh, everybody testified this was very uh, a horrific day, on which uh, between 1,300 and 1,400 uh, people were butchered and killed and uh, raped. And I don't want to repeat all of these horrific uh, descriptions. But the most horrific thing is that Hamas uh, Nukba, Nukba, this is their name, uh, mob and terrorists, uh, had uh, cameras and documented all of that. And when we are going to the uh, Lebanese media, Lebanon, uh, first of all, Palestinians in Lebanon and then Hezbollah entered the war two days later. And uh, if you see the uh, pictures, these are, uh, let's say, pictures of the Twitter pages and the means of media in Lebanon. Some of them are private, some of them are called Hezbollah. And they uh, describe the Israeli media and the Israeli citizens in a very bad manner that uh, let's say, promoted their, their propaganda and messages. So first of all, uh, we see two pictures. One of them is from the Voice of Lebanon. 
And they began to describe half of the thing, meaning that the Israeli Air Force bombed Lebanon without uh, telling why. They sheltered us, they attacked Israel. And we can see, I will enlarge this picture. See the description on the right? This is the bombings of uh, Israeli Ishuvim and Kibbutzim in the northern parts of Israel as were described in a private TV affiliate called Al Mayadin, which is affiliated with Hezbollah. And they took pictures and videos of their attacks on us. They used the Israeli media, as we see here, we see people lying down on the floor. They're saying, settlers of Tel Aviv, see the code of conduct and the definitions. The Hamas's media or Lebanon media or Hezbollah media described Tel Aviv as the central city in Israel and the Israelis as settlers. All of our cities, all of our citizens, our settlers, our temporary, our occupiers, according to their language. This is why they described, and this is these are citizens on the other picture that are storming, according to the text, storming the supermarkets due to the fear of the oncoming war. We can see other pictures in this uh, channel, which is called Al Mayadin, a private channel which is affiliated with Hezbollah, and the descriptions of the horrific pictures of their attacks on Israeli military bases and Israeli uh, small towns and villages in the northern parts of Israel. See the pictures are very horrific. Now, in one word, I want to say that I censored myself and did not add the bad pictures and the bad texts of killings. They're so happy to say we uh, attacked concentrations of Israeli soldiers. We attacked two Israeli citizens. And in Israeli, they're using quotation marks and they do not use the word citizens. They use the words uh, settlers and uh, invaders and occupiers. And by that, they're meaning all of Israel, not the West Bank, not other parts of Israel, but in the Galilee, in Tel Aviv and other parts even in the kibbutzim, like in uh, Otef Aza. But I want to note that even in Lebanon, there are oppositions to the war and to Hezbollah because they understand that Hamas, what Hamas did, uh, drags Lebanon into a war they didn't ask. And this is not my wishful thinking, but I have quotes. First of all, the voice of Lebanon quotes the Jewish leader, Walid Junbalat, and he says, we do not want to be tempted into entering a war. Now, there is a war in Lebanon. Let's say that there is a, an intensive war between Hezbollah and Israel, that Hezbollah attacks Israel on a daily basis, killing soldiers, killing Israeli uh, civilians. And there are people, as uh, were noted before, that were evacuated from the north, both the north and the south, has a number of hundreds of thousands of evacuees. But all by this war, the Lebanese object this thing. Now, the other tweet is a personal page of Jubran Basil. Jubran Basil is a Christian Lebanese politician that sympathizes with Hezbollah, and he calls Hezbollah the resistance. And he says that Hezbollah has all the right to attack Israel. But all by all of that, he says that we don't want to be weakened by Hamas. See the quotes. We do not want to be, and I'm quoting, a bargaining chip in times of war. Now, we say, and I had qu received questions, either in lectures or conventions that I attend, how do they see Israel? What does Israel do? Do we have an Israeli uh, Arab media spokesman? We do. The first picture is of the Israeli military Arab spokesperson, Avichai Drei, Lieutenant Colonel Avichai Drei. And he was quoted in the Lebanese media saying that if Lebanon will drag Israel to the war, Lebanon will be in a war. The other quote is of the Lebanese Independence Day, November 22nd. And they related to Benny Gantz, which is a minister in the special war cabinet. And they quoted him saying that Hezbollah will drag Israel in the war and uh, Hezbollah will pay the price due to his acts. Another quote in Lebanon 24, an independent channel of Yoav Gallant, the Israeli security minister, 
But this quote says that the U.S. and Gallant uh, were talking about not being dragged into a full war in Lebanon. And with this, I want to go to an interesting aspect. Diplomatic efforts of the U.S. and France in Lebanon in order to maintain not a peace treaty, but a ceasefire. We're witnessing in the Israeli media and in the Lebanese media quotes and reports of a very intensive diplomatic effort, first of all, by the U.S. Special Envoy Amos Hochstein. Those of you that read the news and are interested in politics may remember him from the gas rig agreement between Israel and Lebanon a year ago. This mechanism is being operated again in order to ar arrive again to some sort of an agreement to solve Lebanese internal problems. Lebanon is an internal, uh, very, very internal uh, difficult situation. They don't have a president. And the head of the army had to finish his tenure a few days ago. And only yesterday or the day before, they agreed to linger it by a year. But the American envoy wanted to solve all of that and also to revive the 1701 Act Agreement from the end of the Second Lebanese War in 2006, according to which Hezbollah was not supposed to be south of the Litani River. A French diplomatic effort also to promote all of these things. There is a French envoy in Lebanon only a few days ago, Jean-Yves Lederian, and he's promoting that. But see the problem. On last Saturday, December 16th, the French Foreign Minister Catherine Colon had a meeting with the interim prime minister of the interim Lebanese government, uh, Najib Mikati. She canceled it on the last minute due to Lebanese problematic attitude. We say one thing, does the Lebanese country uh, follow the international law and do something? Because we have Hezbollah that literally controls Lebanon and causes a war, but we have the Lebanese army. What does he do? Now, the Lebanese army tweeted in his new media page in October 7th that it patrols the border and tries to maintain peace in accordance with UNIFIL. But it did literally nothing. Uh, the situation got worse. And uh, the Lebanese army tweeted every few weeks that it found some Katyusha launchers, etc. But the war intensifies. But I want to talk about another thing. UNIFIL is the UN a special force to keep the peace in South Lebanon. See a tweet on October 7th in the Voice of Lebanon, according to which, and I quote, Unifil forces said, we opened our doors several times to civilians in South Lebanon under an immediate threat of violence from them, meaning that the Lebanese civilians were not happy and did not show gratitude to the UN, even when it came to their assistance. And the other final thing before I conclude, we see many times proclamations and special speeches by Hassan Nasrallah, who is the Secretary General of Hezbollah, and he holds speeches every one or two weeks. And uh, he uses new media to promote his future speech by saying, I'm going to uh, speak about everything. And everybody's so afraid from his speeches. Now, some technicalities about how to relate to his speech. First of all, I'm talking about a special speech of uh, Hassan Nasrallah on November 11th. He usually makes a, a theatrical approach, you know, speaking with a loud voice. I will attack and everybody will pay the price and we're winning and driving Israel away, etc. On this special speech, he read from a page, so it was different than the regular approach. He showed some new weapons of Hezbollah, like the Volcano rockets, 300 until 500 kilograms, attacking Israel and causing calamity, etc., according to his words. But Nasrallah accused the Arab states from not, uh, let's say, sympathize with the Palestinian cause. And with that, he showed the truth that many, many states, not only in the West, are very angry with Hamas and what he did. He also acknowledged if I'm talking about the diplomacy, U.S. pressure on Hezbollah and the Lebanese government to calm their attacks. He announced victory, but he, he 
disregarded the victorious Israeli picture, allowing a humanitarian corridor in Gaza, allowing for supplies to enter Gaza. And to conclude this, he ignores proclamations, as I presented, and many more, of Lebanese citizens, politicians, religious clerics, and the Lebanese establishment itself that condemn the price that Lebanon pays for Hezbollah's attacks and also Hamas's attacks in Lebanon. I will conclude with some tips on how to relate to media proclamations, reports, and uh, even watching television. The substance and branding of the report matters, meaning the visual report is significant for achievement of influence and branding the message. And media use emphasizes the date of the report, meaning there is a difference on what date or what day was the report or the proclamation, or even if it was on an, an occasion of a diplomatic visit. And the media represents the culture and code of conduct of the culture on which it operates in or from. And the consumer of the media needs to understand that. In one word, if I relate to Lebanon and the Arabic language, and not only in Lebanon, the spoken word has the regular interpretation and some subtleness by using some phrases, words, or even uh, sentences which are a characteristic of the country or the area. Thank you so much.